Hey, fellow Utahns, Ty Burrell here. I may be Oregonian by birth, but I'm all about Utah nowadays, especially when it comes to natural history and science. Did you know our Natural History Museum of Utah has the largest display of horned dinosaurs in the world? It's basically the visitor center from Jurassic Park minus the screaming. As a curious kid, some say prodigy, I've always had this dream of becoming a scientist. When I heard behind the scenes that the Natural History Museum of Utah was canceled this year, I was crushed, but, after I put in a call with my pal Jason at the museum, he agreed to take us through virtually in a robot. I'm so excited to take us behind the scenes and share science with you. I'm not saying I'll come out of it having discovered the sixth dimension, but stand by. Okay, people, let's get curious. Hey, ready for the next adventure? Close enough. Today's my specialty, entomology. Do you like insects? Crickets, get it? <laughs> I love insects, especially true bugs like tree hoppers and cicadas. Okay, let's go. Now to a predator, this pattern looks just like a raptor's eyes. That's why the species is called the owl butterfly. Now, smaller birds see this and stay away. And butterflies don't bite or sting, but they are experts with camouflage and distraction. You wanna see a wow drawer? Wow! Wow! Yes! Well, wait till I open it. I'm just setting the mood. Wow, this is amazing. It's like a nine-course meal for Timon and Pumbaa. These are amazing insects. And look at this. This one's a cicada. They make noises so loud, they're called tree screams. They spend most of their lives underground. And in fact, they pretty much only come out when they eat, mate, and die. Only you could make bugs relatable, Jason. Now this is one of my favorites the peanut-headed bug. Now people think that this looks just like a peanut, but frankly, looking like a peanut isn't all that scary. We think the peanut head and design help this mimic a lizard, which its predators fear. So it can spend more time passively feeding than defending itself. A lot of folks say my head is a distraction too. A bit too handsome. Ready to meet the next specimen? Long as he's dead and mounted. Not a he, it's a she. But don't worry, tarantulas from North and South America don't use their fangs for self-defense. Nothing to worry about. It's so hairy, like me. That's another defense. She kicks those hairs to irritate the eyes and throats of predators like foxes and skunks. Hang tight. Great idea, except um, she's still on my face. Guys, guys, guys. To explore more about our entomology collection and research, we set up a socially distanced interview with our entomology collections manager, Christy Bills. A huge thanks to Ty Burrell for helping us all stay curious during this very unusual time. Thanks, Ty. Behind the scenes is our chance to share the wonders of the museum with all of you. Usually, we're able to do that by inviting you in to meet our amazing team of scientists and explore the collections here at the museum in person. This year, of course, that isn't possible, but we're psyched to have you join us for this one-of-a-kind virtual behind-the-scenes event. Our guest today is the museum's invertebrate collections manager, Christy Bills. Coming up in a few minutes, it'll be your chance to ask Christy the questions. Whatever your biggest bug questions may be, get them ready, and Christy will be happy to answer them. But first, I'm thrilled to be here in the museum's biology collections with Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi. You're the Invertebrates Collections Manager. Invertebrates Collections are an enormous diversity of life. Can yeah. you tell me about them? Yeah, so we have a lovely insect collection, but we also have a lovely uh, shell collection, uh, and we also have a leech collection that I'm really proud of, and we have spiders, and uh, so it represents a lot of different uh, groups. And what about the history of the collections? How did they come about? Where did they come from? The insects originally came to us from old professors at the original University of Utah, so dating back to the late 1800s, 1900s, when university professors would just collect everything. They would just like go out and get whatever. And so we have specimens that date back from that era, the early, early history of the, of the state of Utah even. Eventually, the biology department transferred that collection to the museum in the late 60s and uh, the collection wasn't worked on very much for a few decades, so it sort of just hung out. And then when I started in the late 90s, eventually over time, people found out about it being staffed and we'd get calls from members of the community and they would say, 
my uncle has 5,000 specimens in his garage or I have these specimens I don't want to take care of anymore and like we get 5,000 specimens at a time and they were with complete data, wonderful people that have been collecting and uh, it was just amazing treasures. So it's, that's how it's mostly been built over the last 20 years. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the coverage of the collections? How, how, are they regionally important for the Intermountain West? Are they important for beyond? Yes. Yeah, so we have specimens from six different continents, but uh, the things that I treasure the most are the things from the Intermountain West and from Utah. So uh, the collection represents sort of a history of the geography of Utah, small mining towns that don't exist anymore, uh, interesting characters. Um, people that you know have an interesting history unto themselves. Uh, one very interesting segment of the collection came from Ezra Day, and he was a postal worker, and he collected meticulously from the 1930s to the 1970s, and we got his collection in 1999 with full data, full notes, wonderful connection to his family, and he worked in Utah, but mostly on the west side of the valley, and nobody else was collecting there. So his four decades of collecting represents a really interesting survey of arthropods that nobody else was noticing. So it's really interesting. And at, you know, anybody can drive out there and see the way that has changed dramatically that landscape. And so he created a picture in time of a landscape that will never be back. So it's very special. So you're really painting a picture of the entomology collections and the invertebrates collections here as, as a repository for biodiversity through time and, and how we can track how populations have changed. Is that fair? Absolutely, yes. So each specimen is like a little library book of information. There's the bug, its pin, and then the label that has when and where it was collected and usually the collector. And over time, each specimen increases in value because our techniques at uh, extracting data from that specimen become more sophisticated. So many of our specimens are so old they were collected before we even knew what DNA was. So can you even imagine a specimen collected before people really had toilets in their houses and now you know we still have that bug and we can take pollen grains from it and know what plants it visited. So that bug can give us a bigger picture of the landscape when it was flying. Um, we can now remove uh, pollution from specimens in museums to find out what the air quality was like. So I feel like a specimen that I pick up outside the museum today, in a hundred years, what stories will that specimen be able to tell? It's very exciting. Can you tell me a little bit about who uses the collection? We do tours for students, which I think uh, is exciting because uh, it gives students a sense of wonder and value about the common insects they see around them, like, oh, just a fly, but no, this fly might be unique and it has a name and somebody spent hours looking at it carefully. So uh, I think that it inspires students, young students, college students. Uh, we also get visitors from other research institutions that are interested in our specimens. We have been databasing them, so most of our specimens are online and we try and create um, a portal that everybody can use. So we database our things in a place where other collections are. So people can query and find out what all of these museums hold that were collected in, for instance, San Pete County in May. So you can ask all of these museums, what butterflies would be flying in City Creek Canyon in September? And uh, you can find out historically what's been there. So we try and create different windows into the collection so people visit it in person and people visit it virtually. And we have pictures too that we're really proud of. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I try and make the collection as transparent as possible because we have, uh, we have two uh, diopposing needs of the collection. It needs to be kept very, very safe. We have to have it in a temperature, humidity controlled room because they're very fragile and we don't want any damage to them. We have to keep it pest free. But at the same time, we hold these things for the people of Utah, from school children to researchers to lay people, anybody who's interested. So we want to make it as open and transparent as possible so people can use the data in whatever way they want to. You've spoken about the history of this collection and the historical specimens, but I know that you're also doing some surveys and, and biodiversity work here currently in Utah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so <laughs> 
uh, fireflies. <laughs> About five years ago, I was in a conversation with a researcher at BYU, Seth Bybee, who works on uh, dragonflies, but also fireflies around the world. And we knew there were some fireflies in Utah, but we knew there had to be more, probably, maybe. And there was only a couple populations that were known, but we thought, community science, a partnership between BYU and our museum, perfect match. Um, and so we just started asking people. We created a great campaign, sent out postcards and flyers, and people started telling us. And in the last five years, we've discovered populations in 26, 27 of the 29 counties. So they are all throughout the state. It's really exciting that this really charismatic insect is everywhere in our state. And everybody I talk to is surprised about it, but they're there. And it's wonderful the way farmers and ranchers and a lot of people who live in rural communities knew, but just didn't, eh, you know, didn't think people were interested. But scientists are interested, so it's garnered a lot of um, attention. And uh, now we've expanded the project to looking in Wyoming and Idaho and Nevada, and we are finding them. So it's a very exciting project. Super exciting. Yeah. Can you tell me why it's important to understand what species are living in an area? As the climate changes, uh, we've already noticed uh, there's gonna be range changes. So each specimen is well documented about where it was collected, and then we can tell when uh, things aren't where they were before or when they are new in an area. A new specimen might be invasive and problematic, or it might be new to an area and not problematic. So those questions remain to be answered. But the collection serves as a, as a repository of information about uh, population ranges, and that's really critical to understand, especially as the climate changes and things start to move and change. So I agree with you that the surveys and bio, bio inventories that we do as researchers are super important. Can you tell me about this one particular survey you're doing, the Fife survey? Yes, I'm really excited about it. So it's at a wetland uh, that's managed by, George, uh, by Salt Lake City Parks. So it's right uh, about 9th South and 9th West in a, kind of a neighborhood actually, but it's a, it's a gorgeous small wetland and it's visited by herons and cormorants and sometimes pelicans. It's a lovely place and uh, it's being re-vegetated by a uh, a person who has worked really hard to figure out what the right plants should be there. And as they uh, replant it, also Tree Utah. So there's a lot of community partners involved, which I love when the museum is integrated with great community partners, really smart folks that are working throughout the state to do good work. Um, as the plant community changes to something more natural and less weedy, um, we're gonna see how the bug population changes. So working with uh, younger students to do bio blitzes where we just photo document every living thing there and working with university students to actually make collections over a few years throughout the warmer months, we're gonna see uh, if we get different bees, if we get different uh, beetles, uh, what kind of bugs are coming there. I've still noticed there's no ants there and it used to be a railroad yard. Super interesting. What questions can we ask? And because it's right in a neighborhood, how can we involve the community? So I feel like it's really the museum being outside, finding things, talking to people, having partners, and uh, we'll have those specimens here in perpetuity. So when we collect a bug, we assume responsibility for it forever and make sure that that data becomes available to researchers everywhere. Um, so it's a big responsibility, but I'm really excited for it to ask and answer questions. How long do you expect that survey will go? Mm, four or five years, probably. And that's a minimum, I think, because you get wetter years, you get drier years. So you can't really tell what's happening until you've done it for a few years. And those plants will take a while to grow up. So um, we might six or seven, maybe, years. Christy, thanks for this conversation and for everything that you're doing here at the museum. Coming up next, my colleague Paul Michael Maxfield will host a live Q&A with Christy. So get your questions ready, stay tuned, and we'll see you in just a moment. Hello everybody, my name is Paul Michael Maxfield. I'm broadcasting from the Natural History Museum of Utah's Life Gallery, and I am glad to be with you tonight. Thank you for joining us for our fourth of five nights of behind the scenes Reimagine. We hope you're having a great time and we're going to do our best to keep the party going. Tonight, we're going to be talking about bugs. 
And I'm joined by NHMU entomologist, Christy Bills. And if you don't know her, that should bug you because she's pretty awesome. For the next half hour or so, Christy and I will be taking questions from Facebook, YouTube, and NHMU's website. Folks, if you've got questions about bugs, Christy has answers. So send us your questions now. Let's get started. Christy, okay. thank you for joining us. How are you tonight? Super great. Happy to talk about bugs. Okay, excellent. Well, we have a bunch of questions coming in. Oh my gosh, lots of people want to know about bugs. So why don't we just get started um, with a question about the collections. Um, Sam from Salt Lake would like to know about, um, uh, about the collections. What is the breadth? What is the depth? What are the strengths of the entomology collection at the Natural History Museum of Utah? So um, the collection has about 300,000 specimens. And so it's actually kind of a small collection, but um, small collections like that are like ours are able to um, digitize completely. And so we're able to know more thoroughly what we have than really with a large, large collection with millions of specimens. So um, we have uh, an Intermountain West focus. You know, we have things from different continents and um, we have things that are new about Utah in our collection, and we have things that date back to the 1800s, so that's pretty cool. Um, we have a pretty strong holding of cicadas, and we have a really phenomenal uh, butterfly and moth collection, and some of them were reared from uh, caterpillars or from eggs, and so we also have the notes of the people who um, grew them from those different life stages, and um, those are really important because they tell us um, what different plants they can feed off of. So we have really good lab collection. But we also have a really great leech collection. <laughs> a leech collection? Now that's something I didn't know about. Tell us about the leeches in our collection. So I'm so thrilled about our leech collection because it's not pinned, it's not dry, it's in alcohol. It's kept in jars. And we got it a few years ago and it represents one particular person holding collection. And uh, in pickle jars and mustard jars, just like jars you get from Costco, he took such meticulous notes. He took such good care of it. He's a wonderful researcher. And the collection represents decades of his life's work. And we were able to rehouse the entire thing. And um, he continues to publish papers about it. And now it's in meticulous containers. And it's all databased. And we get interest from other researchers around the world who want to know about the leases of Damon and Nest. All right, how about that? Now, Christy, we're having a little trouble with your audio. So if you can, please speak up. Okay, great, no problem. Um, uh, okay, this is a question from Farmer Fred. Uh, that's, uh, that's what Farmer Fred put in the uh, uh, box. Uh, and um, Farmer Fred from Salt Lake wants to know how to attract beneficial insects to his yard and garden. Oh, I love that question. That's fantastic. Okay, so the best way to to um, to get beneficial insects is to plant an array of plants that bloom at different times and offer offer floral resources, which means flowers. So things that are going to bloom from early spring to late fall, so the bugs have something to come to and um, to have a variety of habitats. So you might want to leave leaf litter and you might wanna leave old dead logs for um, bees to burrow into, and you might wanna leave some bare ground so that uh, bees that nest in the ground can go right into it. So some of it might be um, lazy gardening, leaving things that you might otherwise pull or um, clean up. You don't want a super tidy yard because there's no place for the bugs to hide in the winter, to overwinter. Um, so variety, and um, messiness. <laughs> now I'm a gardener myself and I hate aphids. Uh, they're constantly eating my plants. What kind of beneficial insects uh, would uh, help me manage my aphid problem? Ladybugs, ladybugs and soap and water. So I've been telling you for years to use more soap and water, Paul Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm listening to you tonight. So you can wash your plants. You can uh, uh, just rinse them with a good spray of water, but soap and water is a good way that's non-toxic and won't harm other bugs. 
Um, but they'll, you know, they get eaten by other bugs. We had a crazy year for aphids in Salt Lake. And do you know why we had such a crazy year? All my gardener friends are talking about aphids, aphid, aphids. It was a big year. And it's a very interesting thing that there's uh, boom and bust cycles of insect populations. And I don't know what causes the aphid boom and bust cycle, but boy, aphids are good at reproducing. They are really phenomenal. So Oscar um, from Sandy, he's seven years old, by the way, he was wondering why do fireflies light up? You know, that's a question I've been wondering myself. Hi, Oscar. I love to talk about fireflies almost more than anything, so I'm glad you asked. So fireflies light up so that they can signal to their mate and so that they can also warn predators that they taste that. Okay, so they signal to their mate and then they also warn predators that they, they uh, taste bad. It's almost like having like a really colorful wing or something to, to kind of show that, uh, you know, don't mess with me, mess with me and find out what happens. Yes, exactly, yes. Okay, all right. Um, Noah from Moab would like to know what the rarest bug is in the collection. Hmm. It's probably, the one that comes to mind is the coral pink sand dunes tiger beetle which I know is a mouthful. The bug is only about an inch long, but it's gorgeous. And it's from near Kanab. So Utah, the very bottom in the middle is where Kanab is. And there's a beautiful place called the Coral Pink Sand Dunes. And there it's just gorgeous. And tiger beetles sometimes just inhabit a very tiny space. And uh, this is the only protected insect in the state of Utah. And so we have a few that were collected before it was known to be rare and protected. So it was collected in the 60s. And we have maybe three or four of them that were collected by a hobbyist who was really into tiger beetles. And so uh, it's a beautiful white tiger beetle with iridescent green highlights. And they're very fast and very interesting. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Jen from YouTube Live wants to know what are some interesting insect defense mechanisms? Everything, everything, even <laughs> though you can't even fathom. So you can look like poop. That's a good one. Um, you can uh, smell gross, which is one a lot of things do. You can sting, which is one a lot of people just to think all bugs, you know, can sting or bite you or hurt you, but not very many bugs can because it takes a lot of energy. You can be fast, just run away, right? You can just leave. That's a good one. You can fly really high. Not very many people can catch monarchs because they fly really fast and high. So just being quick is a good defense mechanism and also looking like something scary. So a lot of flies and moths, a lot of bugs just uh, try and trick you by looking like something else. So, but it's interesting the things that we're afraid of and the things that in nature are really more dangerous. So there are spiders that mimic ants. So people think, oh, spiders are dangerous, but actually spiders are like, I wanna look like a real toughy. So I'm gonna try and look like an ant because nobody will mess with me if I look like an ant. Interesting, very tricky. Mm -hmm. Chris from Harriman was curious if there are any good resources for identifying bugs. <laughs> um, so if you have an insect that you'd really like to get identified, a good place to take, if you have a really good photo of it, is to put it on the Facebook group Insect Identification with the place that you took the picture. And uh, there's a group of experts that can ID it and um, other resources. If you have um, something in your home that you're concerned about, the USU Extension Office does identifications of pests. But if you're a real go-getter, you can use resources online like bugguide.net. And that is a place where you can become very knowledgeable about bugs on your own. But you know, your local library has some good books too. So field guides can be very helpful, especially if they're specific to your region of the country. So you don't wanna use butterflies of the Philippines to try and find butterflies of Utah. So 
look for resources specific to the area and then um, go at it. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Lois Alexander from Boulder City, Nevada wants to know if you've ever found fireflies in Nevada and if yes, where you found them. Oh, I can't tell you it's a secret. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we have found them in Nevada. So we found them in Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, and Nevada. So um, in Nevada, they're, um, they've been found at Great Basin National Park. And because it's a national park, we have no collected specimens from there. So as a side note, it's not legal to collect specimens from a national park without a permit. But we've also found them near the mountains by Elko. So that was a great excitement. In 2018, I wanna say it was 2018, maybe 2019, some extremely dedicated museum volunteers who I'm very grateful to drove to where we had a sighting near Elko and collected some for us. And it might've been the first bioluminescent fireflies collected in Nevada for science. Now, if you are looking for fireflies, where would you uh, typically find them? Mm -hmm. So um, if you're looking in the Intermountain West, in this part of the country, you wanna be looking from late May to early July, and you wanna be looking after about 9.45 at night, and you wanna be looking in marshy areas where there's not a lot of bright light. And that's about it. And you'll find them all over the state. But you can't drive by and see them. You have to stop, get out of your car, and hold still, and you'll be shocked how frequently you see them. And I have to get out of my car. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Um, Chris from Moab was wondering if you found fireflies in Grand County. Yes. Moab is an especially interesting locality because we have multiple localities in Moab where they've been collected, but only, or not collected, seen, but only two specimens, and they are entirely different species than the rest of the state of Utah. So I am very curious about them there. Um, again, very dedicated volunteers. Um, went to Moab and collected these with the help of a data reporter who saw them. But we have about five places in Moab where they're known to fly, but they are very hard to catch. They fly faster and higher than the ones in the rest of the state and um, intermittent. You know, people don't always see them every year, but they're known from uh, places even in town like Old City Park. So I would love to get more specimens from there. So if uh, people want to give you more specimens, what should they do? If people want to provide data, first of all, we have a website where people can report when and where they've seen them. It's extremely helpful. Um, it's easy to find. It's just on our website if you look for fireflies. And then uh, if people want to submit specimens and save me a drive to Moab, um, they can email me and we can talk. All right. Well, that sounds like a plan. How cool would that be to help contribute to the Natural History Museum of Utah's uh, entomology collections? Yeah. So when we collect fireflies, we don't just save them in our collection. First of all, we database them. So the information is available to researchers around the world. But then we also share specimens with uh, researchers in two different other institutions. One, one is BYU. And so that way we're sharing specimens and we're sharing data. So science is a very collaborative process and we want as many people to benefit from what we learn as possible. Okay, let's see what we got here. So Sharon from Heber wants to know why do crickets get quiet when we get close to them? Because they don't want you to eat them. <laughs> so is it, it's just that simple? Yeah, they don't know you from a predator. So they're just holding still so that because they're avoiding being eaten. So it's the same reason cicadas do it. So sometimes we'll hear a really loud, almost electronic sounding sound like zzz, from trees. And when you go to approach it, the tree gets quiet and the tree is not making noises. It's cicadas, but they're quiet because they don't know you from a squirrel or a fox or a skunk that might eat them. So they get quiet so you don't eat them or collect them for museums. 
So why do cicadas and crickets and other insects make noise? Uh, for love. To find me. Ooh. <laughs> the same reason we sing under balconies. <laughs> so to draw mates in is why they do it. And, uh, but uh, that's a trick, right? Because you want to let other bugs know where you are when you want to, you know, but you also don't want birds to come find you and munch you, so. Do um, male and female insects typically have different calls? In some groups, the females don't call at all. And in some groups, the males don't call. So like with cicadas, they actually have an organ on their abdomen for making loud noises. Um, and so, yeah, it depends. It varies from group to group. Mm -hmm. And under different conditions too, depending on whether resources are uh, scarce or abundant and who is bringing who gifts like presents for mating. So that's really interesting too. That is very interesting and very sweet actually. Yes. All right. A fan of bees from Sugar House. What a mysterious uh, handle there. A fan of bees from Sugar House. Wants to ke start keeping bees and was curious if you have any tips about getting started. I, there's a lot of resources about that, but beekeeping is a whole different thing than what I do. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't venture to explain how to do it. Um, so I would look to other resources for that. Yeah. Yeah, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think there's an apiarist group, uh, apiarist, a beekeeping folk who in Utah uh, that have a social media following and, and maybe um, our mysterious uh, um, beekeeper would uh, do, do well to check out social media and see what um, they can find. Yeah, and you know what might be a good resource is the Catalyst Magazine recently did Bee Fest and a lot of their videos and material were uploaded to YouTube and other resources. So Bee Fest had a lot of great material about keeping bees. Speaking of bees, um, you know, I hear um, about colony collapse disorder quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like they, they have identified the cause of um, so many bees dying. Is that true? Um, there's a couple causes actually. There's a mite and, um, it's, it's actually kind of complex. Um, but, uh, I think that there's more understanding about there's a variety of ecological factors involved. So I don't know if a lot of people know how much our food supply relies on one species of bees, Apis mellifera. So the Western honeybee is not native to the U.S., it was brought here by Europeans, and um, now we mostly manage it, and we actually truck millions of bees around the country. And we also use um, bumblebees um, because some plants will only be pollinated by bumblebees the way that they buzz, the certain way that they, it's called sonification, where they go and make the flowers release their pollen. So these bumblebees are also trucked around the country, and so any diseases that are these bees carry, both the bumblebees and the honeybees are carried. And if they escape into the wild, then the wild bees. In any case, Utah is home to about a thousand species of bees. And so some people are thinking maybe we shouldn't be so reliant on just these few species for our entire food supply. Not our entire food supply, but like a third of the food that we eat. So a lot of great research is being done at Utah State University in Logan. They have a bee lab that's internationally famous. And um, the bee world is very complex and rich. Speaking of complex and rich bees, Ezra from Bountiful, who is eight years old, wants to know what the rarest bee is in our collection. Oh, Ezra, I couldn't even tell you. I am thinking though of a, the, we have a bumblebee. I don't, you know what, Ezra, I couldn't answer that. That's a really good question. We have some very old bees that I think lived in places that are no longer existing. You know, mining towns that no longer have, are around and um, habitats that are very different than they were a hundred years ago. The world has changed a lot in a hundred years. 
And um, I couldn't tell you what the rarest bee we have is, but that's a, such an interesting question. All of our bees have been databased, but they haven't, we don't have pictures of all of them, but we have a picture of a few of them. And so an adult could probably help you get online and look up pictures of them. And we have pictures you can blow up really big and see them. Um, we do have one in particular that's green that we have a picture of online that's a sweat bee that might be really interesting for you to look at. And it's just lovely. And I want to say it's from 1897. So if you think about rare, none of us can go back to 1897. That's irreplaceable, right? 1897. So that's a really good question. And I might have to have you have an adult email me so I can answer you in an email later. All right, there you have it. Um, now, this is another tough question. I'm not sure if you're gonna know the answer. Um, Aaron from North Salt Lake was curious if we've had any bugs in Utah go extinct. Mm. I don't think we know. So people have been, nobody is keeping explicit track of every single bug species in the state of Utah. So, uh, Mostly we try and keep track of what things are new that come in, which can cause problems. So when something goes extinct, usually something fills its niche very quickly. So I don't think we know the answer. You're gonna have to do some research and find out for us. <laughs> Julia from Ogden was wondering, what are good garden bugs for her grandchildren to play with and which ones should they avoid? Um. So that's wonderful. It's so great to get children out in the garden playing in the dirt and playing with bugs. I think that's fantastic. So um, let's see, roly polies, sometimes called pill bugs, sometimes called potato bugs, wonderful for children to play with, but also to keep as pets. They're wonderful in a jar in the winter to watch them go through their life cycle and molt and mate and have babies. Um, Bugs you shouldn't play with. I can't think of any, maybe black widows. Don't let your kids pick up black widows, but they're also great to observe in a jar through the winter. So um, yeah, I think uh, it's really wonderful for children to keep a notebook and draw the bugs that they're interested and curious about. Um, and also to keep bugs in jars that uh, an adult helps them figure out what to feed so that they can make their own observations. So I encourage all bugs to be loved and played with. Okay, I love that. Um, now, um, I have a question for you. I, I've noticed that there's a lot of, a lot of people are scared of bugs, um, even bugs that they shouldn't be scared of, like say roly polies. Um, do you have any insight into to where that fear comes from and any advice on how to overcome your bug fear? Yeah, so I feel like people are afraid of things they don't understand and they think it's safer to be afraid and to act on that fear by spraying pesticides and cutting down anything that the bugs might be on and just making nature go away. But when we learn more about things, then we can learn not to be afraid of them. So, uh, and I think this applies to a lot of things in life. The more we learn about it, the more we can learn what things we don't actually need to be afraid of and we can enjoy life more. So there's actually not very many bugs to be afraid of. And when you're not afraid of them, you can be more comfortable outside and you can also enjoy their loveliness more. So I don't blame people for being afraid because they just don't know and they feel like they're erring on the side of caution but um, I think a lot of times we cause harm to our environment and to ourselves when we act on that fear. So I encourage people to spend time to learn about what they actually need to be afraid of bug wise so that they can be more at ease in the world. Sarah from Salt Lake City was curious if we can use bugs to study air pollution. <gasps> Ooh, maybe. So I know bird specimens in museums have been used to um, test for pollution on their feathers. And wouldn't it be interesting to do the same with butterfly scales? Because you could just remove a few scales with a paintbrush and see what pollution was on them because they've all been sealed away in drawers. 
some of them for a century, right? Oh, that would be super interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You should write a paper on that. <laughs> now, if I remember right, uh, this is a while back, but you were telling me something about uh, some moths uh, that changed color based on air pollution. This, do you remember that? Yeah. So during, I think it was Darwin's time in England, there was a town with trees that were kind of white, like our aspens. And the moths that lived in this forest were, um, they had two forms. Some were white and some were black. And when uh, this factory first moved in, most of the moths were white. So they landed on the trees and they blended in. But after the factory had put a lot of pollution in the air, the trees became black. They became dark with soot. And then all the white moths were eaten by predators and the black moths became more prevalent in the population. And then there became laws about the pollution and the factory got cleaner and then the trees got white again and then the white moths became prevalent in the population. Okay, well, I, I re now I remember, that is a really interesting story. Um, Tim from Moab was wondering if there were any insects or arthropods in Utah you've never seen but have been searching for? They're predator. Can you say that one more time, Christy? Where did we cut off? Tim from Moab was wondering if there were any insects or arthropods in Utah you've never seen but have been searching for. Oh. Gosh, I hope there's some that I, you know, I hadn't, I've been working on entomology for like 25 years and I hadn't seen fireflies until like 2014, like only until like the last six years. So what things haven't I seen? I don't even know. And that's super exciting, but I haven't seen fireflies from Tooele or Carbon County. And that makes me a little bit crazy. I really want to see fireflies from there but I'm also interested to know what things I can't even imagine are here yet and will be surprised by, because I'm often surprised by things outside, especially bugs. I get surprised a lot. In fact, I was it was only about 10 years ago that I was in Memory Grove, which is in downtown Salt Lake, and I was with a group of children and a little sweet child turned to me in her upturned hand and had a slug that was about five inches long. And I'd never seen anything like that in the state of Utah, it blew my mind. And it turns out we have a few and people see them occasionally, but it was an enormous surprise to me. So um, I wish all of you many large slugs because it's like that moment of what, these are here, this is so exciting and wonderful, you know? Um, so of course I contacted the Department of Agriculture and we talked about it for a while and they were surprised too. But it just goes to show you, even small children can find things that are surprising to scientists, you know? Well, we wish you many large slugs too, Christy Bills. Um, while we're on the topic, what is an arthropod? And what's the difference between bugs and insects? Sure. So um, arthropod, the word pod means foot, jointed foot. So arthropod includes insects, which have six legs. Um, arachnids, which includes the spiders, and there's a whole group of the millipedes and centipedes. They're kind of in the same family together. And then also crustaceans. So crustaceans are lobs, lobsters, crabs, and also roly polies. So roly polies are in the same family with crabs and lobsters. Isn't that fun? And then um, uh, but insects in, have a special group called bugs. So there's a special group that's the true bugs in the insect class, and they have a beak for sucking plant juices, and they have wings that cross over, and that includes the box elder bugs and um, a few other bugs people see commonly. So I don't mind people using the term bug for whatever they want to use it for, but bugs are a special, unique group in the insects. So... Uh... We can say things like insects and bugs, but in science, true bugs are, mean something different than insects. Yes, it means the hemipterans. Yes. And then you, you talk about worms. How many legs do worms have? None. 
They have none. So they're not even an arthropod. Snails as well. Snails don't get to be in the arthropod group. Frank Dorr, watching on Facebook, uh, wants to know if there were any fire ants in Utah. Nope. Nope. We have plenty of other ants. So we are busy with our other ants. Thank you very much. We do not want any fire ants. <laughs> and hopefully we never will. There, ants are very interesting because they're great at moving to different regions of the world. So I don't know that we won't have fire ants in the future. We certainly have ants now that we didn't have 20 years ago. And uh, our ant populations certainly change rapidly. And hopefully we won't get fire ants or crazy ants are alarming, so. Eddie on YouTube uh, would like to know if we have any brown recluses in Utah. One of my favorite questions, the answer is no, 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 no. <laughs> so um, you don't have to take my word for it. You can look up the range of brown recluse spiders and it doesn't include Utah. We don't have the right conditions, so you don't have to worry about it. So is it fair to say that like the, the, the bug that we really have to worry about are black widows? That's kind of like the main bug that we, we need to, to kind of make sure that we stay away from. Yes, however, you wouldn't want to get a tick bite either. So if you're going out for a hike where there's weeds, um, it's not a bad idea to wear bug spray because ticks are not great either. They can transmit diseases. So it's uh, not venom that we need to worry about, it's disease transmission. So for people who are older, uh, like grandparent age, it's smart to avoid mosquito bites because rarely mosquitoes in Utah can transmit West Nile virus. Um, so that and ticks and black widows. But black widows are, they rarely, rarely bite. So they're not, a, they don't chase people. What is the most deadly bug in the world? <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I don't spend time thinking about that. I only live here, so I don't worry about it. Well, the most deadly bug in the world is a mosquito because they transmit diseases to people. And so it's not like a scorpion or a spider, it's mosquitoes. And so um, a lot of entomologists get into the field of entomology because they want to relieve human suffering because they want to keep people from dying. This doesn't happen in Utah. We don't have malaria in Utah. They want to help people in other continents be prevented from getting mosquito-borne diseases. And that's a really important thing that we can concentrate our efforts on. Nichelle Osaurus watching on Facebook Live wants to know what happens to summer insects in the winter? So um, if you've ever put your hand in a pile of leaves, um, even in the cool weather, you'll find that it's warm and it's because uh, the leaves are breaking down and they're giving off energy. So bugs know how to hide in warm places like that. So they burrow down in the soil or they burrow below the frost line. Some bugs just die like um, grasshoppers and praying mantises. They just die in the winter and their eggs are the life stage that overwinters. So their eggs are buried in the soil or they're hidden under logs where they're prevented from freezing and um, the parent dies. But um, some bugs, even adult butterflies, we have a beautiful adult butterfly called a morning cloak. And as the adult, it can overwinter. And it's the first we see flying in the spring, one of the first we see flying in the spring. So they know how to hide in the crevices of trees and they know how to protect themselves from the freezing weather. A big fan of bugs from Salt Lake City was curious if people ever donate their insect collections to the museum. Yes, so um, that has happened a few times, uh, four or five times, and we are so grateful. So we're interested in insects that were collected legally and that have full data. So um, specimens that were not collected in national or state parks without permits. And uh, we love specimens that were collected by people who didn't do it professionally, but just were very passionate about um, about insect collecting. Yeah, that is a really wonderful way that the science can move forward. And I love that about entomology, that it's accessible um, as, a, as a science to people who have other jobs. So you don't have to have 
a jackhammer or you don't have to have a scanning electron microscope. You can be a really accomplished entomologist and have a whole different job during the day. So yes, if you have an amazing insect collection, send us an email and we can talk. So if, if somebody does want to uh, donate their bugs, then they can send you an email and then begin the discussion? Yes, yes. Now, why is it so important to have data associated with the bugs? Mm -hmm. So every specimen, every teeny bug on a pin is such valuable, important data, but only if we know where it was collected and when it was collected and who collected it. So a bug collected in May and a bug collected in October tell us very different stories. And a bug collected at super high altitude and super low altitude and on the shore of a river and up in a tree, these bugs all are telling different stories. But if you just give me a bug on a pin, then I can use it for education, but I can't use it for research. So we have to have its, uh, its full story. It's like, a, it's like a book with no words. <laughs> that would be a short read. I just made that up, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too. Uh, Anastasia from Sandy wants to know, what is the most common ant in Utah? I don't know. That's a good question. And it probably varies because Utah has so many different kinds of habitats. We have desert and we have high mountain and uh, we have urban areas. So I couldn't answer for sure. Um, we have a lot of harvester ants. Oh, I'm sure an ant researcher can answer better than me. I, I was told by an ant expert, though, that we have 40 different species probably in Red Butte Canyon. And so, you know, there's so many different ants. Uh, that's a very good question. And I couldn't tell you the answer. <laughs> but if you're interested in ants, I do have a resource to send you to. There's a website called Ant Web, and uh, it's the most comprehensive ant resource in the world. And there's, I mean, if you just want to look at cool, weird ant heads, which you could do for hours, they're mind boggling. Go look at ant web. Jins, who's watching on Facebook Live, wanted to know how to discourage hornets. Um, mm. <laughs> Depends on the kind. There's a few different kinds. Um, when their nests are new, remove them before they get to have big nests. Um, if I'm putting a structure up in my yard and I see that there's a hole that would be inviting for them, I try and block it or plug it so it doesn't look like a place where a mama wants to make a nest. It's a, but if they are very good at finding places to be, so I, you have to be attentive to where they're setting up nests early in the summer and just knock them down before they get set up. That's my suggestion. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a wasp, a hornet, and a yellow jacket? Oh, uh, so a uh, wasp is um, a term that applies to thousands and thousands of different species. And there's teeny tiny wasps and there's great big wasps. And actually the teeny tiny ones um, are doing a lot of important jobs around the world that we take for granted. Um, even in Utah, there's just an enormous variety of wasps. And our biggest wasp that has a giant ovipositor, like I'm not exaggerating, can't sting you. So wasps are interesting and weird. Um, Hornets are a particular class, I think, in the Vespid group, and they are stinging. Yellow jacket is a type of wasp that um, is invasive to Utah. So she's not supposed to be here, and she can be a little naughty and bother your picnic late in the summer. Um, but they also clean up dead things. So, um, but we have a lot of different kinds of wasps. You know, there's mud daubers, and there's, I mean, the variety of wasps is so comprehensive. And there's a new book out called Wasps by Eric Eaton that I highly recommend. So um, there's a lot of answers to this question. <laughs> but I All also right. look at pictures of tiny wasps because they're very weird and interesting. Chris from Salt Lake City wants to know, what is the story with murder hornets? Oh, 
Oh, I forgot all about those for a minute. Okay, so murder hornets are native to Asia and they do eat honeybees. And bugs are good at traveling around the world. And somehow some of them got to Washington. Not Washington, D.C., but Washington State. And somebody reported them, and that's great. And that was last year. And uh, then they couldn't find any for a while, and they thought that they everything was good. And then they found some more this year, because 2020. And uh, it looks like they have eradicated the murder hornets in Washington. Um, they are really big, and uh, they are problematic. Yeah, you know, but they so far seem to be eradicated in the U.S., but what's actually more interesting <laughs> is that there are invasive insects and uh, invasive um, things coming into different areas all the time. And there are people that work for state agencies and county agencies watching all the time. And there are people who are trying to control these things to protect our agriculture and to protect our forests and to protect our, um, our wild spaces. So these are not always flashy, like murder hornets. Sometimes they're a tiny, tiny beetle. But if it gets out like a Japanese beetle, it can devastate acres and acres of trees. So this, the way that people can participate is by knowing the plants and insects in their environment. And when they see something kind of unusual, you can take a picture and document it on iNaturalist. Or if you think this, this seems like it might be one of those pests that we're trying to look for, like emerald ash borer, just kind of know what your extension agents are looking for and say like, you know, I'm going to be a helper and look for these invasive things. Because it's not always about murder. It's about devastating our crops or devastating our forests, like with gypsy moths. So you can be a participant in kind of documenting and being aware and helping the people that are always on the front lines trying to protect us. So um, just to be clear, are there murder hornets in Utah? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. No, there's no murder hornets in Utah. Are you sure? Yes. Yes, I am sure. All right. There you have it, folks. No murder hornets in Utah. Addie Zeller from uh, Bountiful wants to know what kind of dragonflies we have in our collection and what is your favorite king of dragonfly oh aren't dragonflies amazing i'm so glad you asked about them dragonflies are so awesome aren't they so uh we have a representative sample of all the dragonflies that fly here we have darners and we have meadow hawks and i think of them by family name which are kind of fun to say too like libelulid and gomphidae um, but we also have some of the damselflies. So if you like dragonflies, you might like damselflies. They're the ones that are smaller and super delicate. And sometimes they're like a sky blue and um, they hold their wings together when they're resting instead of out and open. Um, and they're in the same order, Odonata. Um, so we have adult dragonflies, but we also have juvenile dragonflies. So they live in ponds or stagnant water when they're juveniles. And uh, they're called naiads, which sounds sort of mythical. It comes from Greek mythology. And um, we have, we keep those in alcohol. So we have a whole bunch of dragonflies in two different storage ways. Um, what's my favorite? Oh, it changes all the time. Probably, um, I just love the big darners. I can't get over how big and gorgeous they are and how pretty their wings are. And I love the shape of their wings. I love them. I'm glad you like them too. Nichelle watching on Facebook Live wants to know if we have any worms in our collections. No, no worms. We really don't. We have the leeches, but they're not worms. We don't really have any worms. We have some big millipedes, but they're not worms either. What about parasitic worms? Do we have any parasitic worms? Don't, but does Nichelle want to help me start a worm collection? <laughs> That's a good question. Nichelle, if you would like to help Christy start a worm collection, let us know. Uh, Joshua Jones watching YouTube live was curious. If there had been any recent invasive species to Utah or nearby areas. Invasive species of insects? Yes. Like all the time, all the time. So, uh, People might be noticing in Salt Lake this little brown bug in your house, 
and it's called an elm seed bug. And they're really common and they come indoors this time of year. And uh, they're not really a problem. You know, they're not gonna decimate crops or trees or anything, but they're pesty. And uh, they've only been in the state, I wanna say since 2008. Um, so new things move in all the time. And I wanna say there's some ants that are new too. Um, I feel like there's an odiferous ant that's I'm seeing in urban Salt Lake City that's new as well. It'd be hard to document because things are moving so fast, you know. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I have to think about it for a long time. I don't want to use up too much time thinking about it. But things are moving quickly. Yeah. Kylie Eamon, uh, who's watching on Facebook Live, uh, wants to know why tarantulas get so big, especially in comparison to other spiders. Yeah. Why do they get so big? They're kind of at the upper limit of how big an arthropod can get. So they can't get much bigger because they have something called book lungs. So it's how they breathe and it's not an efficient way to oxygenate their bodies. So they can't get much bigger and they're actually not very fast because they aren't good at oxygenating. Why do they get so big? I don't know, but you know, the tarantula we have in Utah, a fauna pelma iodeus lives about 25 years. So maybe it's bigness helps it survive the winters underground. I mean, why couldn't they just be small? If you've ever seen a baby tarantula, they're cute like puppies. They have kind of soft paws. They're really adorable. So I wouldn't mind if they just stayed puppy small and cute, but uh, they do get big. Why do they get big and not just stay small? Well, it helps them take bigger prey items, right? If they're bigger, they can eat bigger things. Maybe that's why, because other spiders are filling the smaller spider niche. That might be why, right? Yeah, that's that. That sounds good. That uh, um, there's a lot of small spiders that are eating small bugs, and uh, uh, tarantulas uh, by getting so big, have kind of they're able to eat bigger uh, insects. Yeah. Uh, Vienna Zeller uh, from Bountiful wants to know if there are any extinct grasshoppers. Oh, there's a really, really interesting story about the Rocky Mountain locust that was of plague proportions when pioneers first came across the plains and then they disappeared. So that would be the most interesting extinct grasshopper story. And it's been written about by um, a Wyoming professor named Jeffrey Lockwood, who's one of my favorite entomology writers. He wrote uh, Grasshopper Dreaming and he wrote uh, Locust, which is a book about this extinct grasshopper. So if you wanna learn more about it, I recommend you read Locust. And it's fascinating to me. One of my favorite stories is the way things that are very common can, become, can disappear. So everything that we take for granted, like box elder bugs, which seem very prolific and, oh, there's so many of them, there could be a world in three or four or five or 10 years where they're all gone, right? Bison used to be everywhere. Uh, passenger pigeons used to be everywhere. And this Rocky Mountain locust used to be everywhere. And now they're gone. Anyway, if you read Jeffrey Lockwood's book, you'll find out what he thinks about it. So what do grasshoppers dream about? Uh, grass, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and hopping. And hopping. And each other. Uh, Ellen Erickson, watching on Facebook Live, wants to know what fun insects or arachnids are active during this time of year? Um, I don't have a good science answer, but I, what I've noticed is that for some reason, I'm still seeing, um, yellow jackets flying. And I was thinking just the other day, I wonder why they're still able to fly as it gets colder. Some things seem to be able to adapt to having a longer season. Like it's, it's winter, you can go to bed now, but they're still foraging and that's impressive. And I wonder what adaptation they have morphologically. What about their body allows them to be active in the cold like this? I don't know. But you know, if you look around your house, there's probably house centipedes that have adapted to be in our homes. Um, there's probably cockroaches in some buildings. Of course, there's cockroaches in some buildings. 
Um, and then some bugs that just have hidden away in our structures, like ladybugs sometimes do, box elder bugs sometimes do, some spiders learn to take up residence. But the spiders are only there because there's food for them to eat. So there's other little critters that are that they're making snacks of. So your home is now the habitat of arthropods. Speaking of which, I have a bunch of spiders moving in my house. Now, normally I just let them stay in the corners. Is that the right thing to do or should I put them outside? So if you put a spider outside, then you've killed it. You're not, you're not, can, you're not being merciful especially in the winter, but in the summer too. So there's house spiders and there's outside spiders. And some outside spiders will get inside, but if there's a spider in your house, it probably has something to eat in there or else it'll die on its own. So putting a spider outside is not doing it a favor. You're doing the right thing by just letting it be in the corner. Okay, spiders, you're safe this year. Thanks to Christy Bills. <laughs> Uh, Noah, age eight, from Moab, noticed when hiking, he sees a lot of ladybugs under rocks at elevations of 12,000 feet. Why are there so many ladybugs up there? Noah, I'm impressed you're at 8,000, you're up at 12,000 feet. I mean, I, why are you up there? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not really sure, but it'd be cool to have specimens from that height. That's impressive, or that elevation. Um they could be blown up there is one thing, but they could be unique to that elevation. So it's amazing that you're, it's cool that you're noticing that. I'm super impressed. And also uh, they could be, they could be blown up there. They're certainly not being carried by prey because not very many things eat ladybugs because they're pretty nasty. So my recommendation is that you take a picture of them because a lot of times ladybugs can be ID'd from a photo. A lot of things can't, but ladybugs often can. And you can post it to iNaturalist or you can post it to Insect Identification Group and um, see if we can figure out what ladybugs you're seeing because I'm very curious. Hi, Lee, watching on Facebook Live. I was curious if insects can become fossils. Yep. Yeah, they can. So because of their hard exoskeleton, um, they have their bones on the outside. They make great fossils. Anastasia from Sandy ate some lemon ants in Peru and was curious if we had ants like those here in Utah. I don't think we have lemon ants, but I was walking in Miller Park a couple summers ago and I saw these beautiful, very orange tiny ants and they smelled just like citrus candy. They were so fragrant and amazing. So I wonder if they're in the same genus as your lemon ants. I was really excited. They were the most delicious smelling ants I've ever come across. Anastasia, if you like lemon ants, you should try lemons. They'll blow your mind. <laughs> Tommy, uh, age six from Bountiful, wants to know, what bugs do you think are the prettiest? All bugs, all bugs. I don't know. I like, there's a lot of really amazing beetles. Beetles never cease to amaze me. There's um, really gorgeous, shiny beetles that are blue and purple and striped. There's these beetles that are gold, not like kind of gold, but like the chrome of a car gold um, that are silver sometimes too, that just don't even seem, it seems like everything humans create just pales in comparison, you know, just, we just pale in comparison. Um, there's a lot of bugs I think are really pretty. There's some blue wasps. There's a tarantula hawk wasp from the West Desert near like Tooele County that's uh, like a bluish black and she has amber colored wings. Oh, stunning, just stunning. I can answer this question for a full hour. So it's hard to say there's a lot of really, really pretty bugs in the world. Now I know one of your personal favorite bugs is the ichumonid wasp, mm. which you uh, were talking about earlier. Do you mind telling people a little bit about ichumonid wasps and why yeah. you like them so much? So ichumonids are super fascinating because uh, they're giant, so they seem scary, but they are harmless to people. So uh, the female body is about two inches long and her ovipositor is about four inches long. 
And uh, they're not uncommon in Utah. I see them in foresty areas like uh, Miller Park, Tanner Park, uh, up, up the canyons. And uh, the female uses her ovipositor. She can bend it around and she can, it's serrated like a knife and she can saw it into trees. And then she lays an egg in the larva of another wasp. So she parasitizes that other wasp and her, so her baby will hatch out and eat that larva. And then she will burrow further into the tree and be an adult and then she'll burrow out of the tree. And they're phenomenal to see. They're just really impressive. And when she's doing her sawing into the tree, you can get right up close to her and she doesn't mind. She's busy doing her own thing. So they're one of the most impressive insects we have. Although we have some other cool ones here in Utah. We're really lucky. We have a lot of cool bugs here. Angie on Facebook Live uh, wants to know what kind of bugs are good pets? Oh, all bugs are almost are good pets. <laughs> so if you're lucky enough to come across a velvet ant, velvet ants live in the desert and they're fuzzy. Um, if they're wingless, they're a female and they eat sugar water and they live about nine months and they sting. So you have to scoop them up with a spoon or a container, but uh, they can't climb the sides of glass containers. And they're quite happy on a little sandy substrate and they're so adorable. They can be red or orange or white and they make amazing pets. The beetles that are on the, um, in the foothills that are black and that when they're scared, they put their bottoms up in the air also make amazing pets. They eat oatmeal and zucchini and apple and pretty much what you'd eat for breakfast. And they live um, four or five years and they're easy to handle and they're super adorable. I think uh, roly polies as a little community in a glass jar, you can just use an old peanut butter jar, put in some leaves and some pine cone and some carrot and keep the soil kind of damp. And you can get a whole little community going where you have um, families and babies and uh, you can see their molts and you can see um, see them grow. So those are pretty amazing. Um, I think spiders are nice to keep too because you don't have to feed them super often, but you just find another bug to feed them and throw it in there. Thomas uh, would like to know um, about the different kinds of jobs uh, that you could have uh, in entomology. Yes, so there's actually a lot of different kinds of work that entomologists do. So um, I work at a museum, obviously, and I take care of dead bugs, mostly. That's a lot of my job. And I talk to people about bugs. That's another part of my job. But there are people who work specifically in protecting forests from bugs. And there are people who work in agriculture to have protect crops from bugs or help understand what bugs will help crops best. And that's a really important job. And there are people who work in medical entomology to help protect um, people from diseases that are caused by bugs. And that's also super important. So, you know, really, really vital parts of human society. Do you have any advice for uh, budding entomologists? Uh, yeah, so I feel like anybody can be an entomologist. There's a ton of resources online and ways to get involved with entomology. Um, you can definitely go to college for it, but you also don't have to um, make it your career. You can study bugs in your spare time. So if you have a love of entomology and you have another job, don't feel like you can't do entomology because you definitely can. It's always open to you. And for young people that are interested, um, find uh, books about it, but also keep your own notes. So I always suggest to young people, get a notebook and make nature observations. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be good. Make all, every observation needs is a date and your notes. They can just be drawings. They can be, you taped a feather in, you drew the clouds, you sketched a bug and anybody who's, you know, from four years old to a hundred years old can do something like that. But uh, people who keep nature journals can um, document their own observations and they can be as sophisticated or complex as you want them to be, especially for little people as they get older, their observations and their handwriting and their can become more sophisticated. So highly recommend the nature journaling. Tom uh, Schofield on Facebook Live wants to know why silkworms don't live in Utah. In pioneer times, 
they tried to bring silkworms to Utah and it failed. And I'm trying to remember why. I think it was just too dry here. It was just too dry, but they sure tried, bless their hearts. Um, we do have other moths because it's a moth larva in the same genus. They're gorgeous. So we have silk, uh, giant silk moths in the Saturnid family. So if you look up Cecropia moths, um, we have some and they're really, really pretty. Um, so I don't think we have anything to be sad about because we have these beautiful moths. But if you want to start a silk industry, you're going to have to move to a damper climate. Mike uh, from uh, Facebook Live uh, wants to know um, about some of Utah's most unusual bugs. So we have probably the one thing that is the most weird that people call me about is the Jerusalem cricket. So when uh, I've taken calls, you know, I've, people have contacted me over the last 20 years. And if somebody says, I have this really ugly bug, sadly, every single time it's been a Jerusalem cricket, poor Jerusalem crickets. So they're a wingless bug that um, has a very smooth head and digger legs and a striped abdomen and very thin antenna and this really smooth head with teeny tiny eyes. And the first time you see one, it's pretty freaky. They get a little bit large, maybe two and a half inches. And um, they're disturbing until you know what they are. But then once you know where they are, they're kind of adorable. Um, they look a lot like a, a cutie bug, cootie bug from this Milton Bradley game from, I don't know, decades ago. Anyway. I remember cooties. That was one of my favorite games growing up. The gateway. You'll turn into an entomologist if you play it. So um, the... Jerusalem cricket burrows, they're solitary, nocturnal, and burrowing, so people don't see them very often, but they're actually throughout the whole state because they're kind of a desert dweller, and um, when you do see them, I remember the second one I ever saw, I was driving in my car, and I saw it crossing the road, and it was so big that I stopped the car, you know, <laughs> but um, that's probably the weirdest bug. Um, we have velvet ants, and we have, um, we actually have a really large centipede in southern Utah um, that's not seen super often. And then we also have wind scorpions, um, uh, which have kind of a pointy head. In the Middle East, they get about four inches, but here they only get like an inch and a half. And they're very fragile. They're not an insect, they're a kind of arachnid, but their heads come to a point with four mandibles like this. And so they look kind of freaky, but they're actually kind of a princess bug. They are big babies. Now you go out in the field and, and collect bugs uh, often. Can you share with us uh, one of your most favorite memories from collecting bugs in the field? Oh gosh, every time I'm outside collecting bugs, I'm happy and <laughs> it's hard to say. It's hard for me to think of one favorite. Um, I feel like every time I see fireflies, I feel like it's super, super magical. But every time I'm out with children, it also feels very magical because kids open your eyes to seeing things in new ways. So I can't pin down a single memory, but I always feel like when I spend time outside looking for bugs, I feel like I'm going to live longer. I feel like my, my life is extended with so much joy, but probably people feel the same way looking for plants or flowers. Anytime you spend out in nature is good for you. Well, there you have it. Christy, thank you so much for your time tonight. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Be sure to join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. as Ty and Jason take us into the paleontology collections. If you haven't already, be sure to explore the behind the scenes reimagined on our web pages. There you'll find photo galleries and videos and stories and 3D models, all showcasing the scientists, collections and research that goes on behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. And remember, stay curious. <laughs>